people rise to the occasion. And so when uh, people are out there on the, the, the guys and gals that we have out there working on the floor, they know that they're responsible for carrying on the culture. And it's a weight that they carry and it's a badge that they carry proudly. So even when new people come in, temp workers or uh, someone that's new to the new to the team, we've already established that. In 2016, I co-founded a drinkware company called Simple Modern. I was obsessed with the question, what would happen if we built a for-profit company focused on generosity? This podcast is a behind-the-scenes look at how we scaled from a bootstrapped startup to nine figures in annual revenue. We'll share with you the strategies we used, things learned along the way, and how we built a different type of company. This is Scaling for Good. Welcome back to Scaling for Good. I'm Mike Beckham, your host and the co-founder and CEO of Simple Modern. In 2020 and 21, the world saw the biggest seismic shock to its supply chain that it had seen in decades. Shipments went from taking only weeks to taking months. Container prices skyrocketed by as much as 10x. The exchange rate between the dollar and other foreign currencies swung wildly. And if you were importing products like Simple Modern, you felt the pain. It was a period of tremendous turmoil. In fact, some products you couldn't even get if they were produced in parts of China or the rest of the world due to the gridlock in the supply chain. It was during that period that we made the decision to take on domestic manufacturing, reshoring some of our production to America. And today, I'm excited to have two of the people that have led the charge in that effort for us. So I'd like to introduce you to Wes Zimmerman, who's our production manager, and Jenny Scott, who's our engineering manager. Welcome to the show, guys. How did you go about going from zero to one with this idea of manufacturing product in the United States? Part of this started um, with just this a, a very complete understanding that we don't know what we're doing, right? Mm -hmm. It started with learning how to ask the right questions, learning who are the players in this field? Where do you go to to talk to the right people. It was a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, a lot of visits, um, asking questions, taking on the attitude of a learner, um, being willing to uh, really not be the smartest person in the room or, or even know anything about, about mm -hmm. the conversation. But it's amazing how well people receive that and want to help people who are asking the right questions and are deeply curious about uh, manufacturing and success. So, um, that's really how it started, was just asking questions and finding the people who are doing it and, and sitting down and learning as much as possible. And it's a surprisingly small community, I would say. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of people in America that are still involved in manufacturing, but once you start to kind of get into particular industries, there's actually not that many experts. And I think one of the things, I don't know if you would agree with this, but it seems like from my perspective, one of the things that's happened over the last 20 or 30 years is that we haven't really developed the next generation of talent in a lot of these areas, whether that's, you know, tooling or, or anything else. That There's a lot of talent overseas that's been developed because so much stuff has been outsourced, um, but it's a relatively small community here. And like you said, Jenny, that we've actually found it to be a very receptive and supportive community because they, they want to help people like us that we're trying to do something hard. Um, you know, Wes, so from your perspective, uh, what were the challenges in making those initial connections? I mean, you were coming from a manufacturing background, but paper and rocks are pretty different than water bottles. So what was the transition you had to make to kind of get into the mindset of being able to pull this project off? So the biggest thing for me was, you know, I've, I've done several projects throughout my career. They range from a few thousand dollars that just barely made a blip on the map to being part of a 90 plus million dollar uh, plant upgrade at a paper mill. So you know, having those varying levels of, of preparedness um, it helped me, but it was also a little bit eye opening um, starting from scratch. So, you know, I was involved with the, the plant layout. Um, uh, Jenny had most of the equipment um, already purchased or uh, spec at that point. So getting to plug in those components and, and use some of our industrial engineering uh, capabilities to, to make sure that those are in the right order or, you know, they're in the best, uh, best layout possible. Um, the biggest challenge after that was just balancing that level of, of 
preparedness versus just getting after it. So with a lot of the bigger projects, you already have an established process that you're either mm -hmm. modifying or adding to. So you already know what your end goal is uh, in, in detail and your all of your planning goes into the specific things it takes to hit those targets. Ours was unique in a sense that we knew, of course, what product we wanted to make, but at what capacities, um, what were our uh, demands going to look like. Uh, we have this blank canvas. So balancing that that preparedness and that that planning up front, it's good to plan but not get stuck in, you know, the analysis paralysis and yeah. and just keep thinking. Um, I'm I, I am proud of the fact that I'm able to just get started. I can only think about something for so long and then you just got to get started. So yeah. we got to jump in and start doing it. You're, you can't, we kind of lived for quite a while between those, those two euphemisms that, you know, you want to have a bias to action and you want to measure twice, cut once and trying to figure out, Hey, when do we take the extra time of planning mm -hmm. and waiting? And when do we just say, Hey, an imperfect decision made today is better than, than doing nothing. Do you have an example where you felt like having a bias to action led to an imperfect, but helpful outcome? Um, probably really the, when we first got started, um, I was, I was, of course, gung. I still am gung ho, but really, really ready to to get after it and and add all the processes we could possibly add um, to the point where honestly it was a, it was a little frustrating because some of the programs that I thought we were going to take on, you know, we we either decided not to do or, or we didn't didn't uh, get in the first place. So um, some some frustrations fell in to where I, I really you know, felt like the, the reins were, were pulled back a little too far mm -hmm. when in fact that turned into a blessing. You know, yeah. you know, we, so that was the challenge for me was just really finding that balance internally of, you know, look, I, I wholeheartedly trust everybody in the, in the leadership team, but just really knowing that, Hey, they've got this handled. These guys know what we need to do when we need to do it. I just need to carry it out when, when I'm called on. So well, you, you guys mentioned it, and I think it's worth emphasizing that it's one thing to say, hey, can we make this product? Can we make one of this product? And that is one question, and that requires certainly some knowledge. But there's a lot of different um, tools and machines that you could use, a lot of different ways to accomplish the goal of making one of something. But manufacturing is really this intersection of I need to make this thing, and I need to make it at this speed, and I need to make this many of it. And that that's where all the complexity lies, right? It's not even just in can I make one of this thing, but can I make the appropriate number of these things at the appropriate rate for what the business needs? And that's kind of what you're alluding to. This is one of the things we've learned along the way. We decided to start with plastic bottles because we, we really felt like this will be the easiest. The problem is that insulated stainless steel has become the dominant part of the market. And so we've actually found it's been harder to get the consistency of the volume that we wanted with plastic and that that's created another kind of challenge. So as you've been trying to tackle this problem, but also try with a lot of unknowns, like how many are we going to need to be able to make an hour and what is the total demand? How has that changed the way that, Jenny, that you've approached looking at machinery? That I mean, I guess I should say a big part of your role has been looking at different machines and trying to make purchasing decisions, vetting different um, machines that we could buy. So how do you make decisions around very expensive pieces of equipment when there's uncertainty about exactly what your needs are? Um, that's the challenge. Like that's been the, that's been the yeah. hardest thing that we've had to do. And, and, um, the thing that we have kept in mind the whole time is, um, ultimately flexibility. Like what is it that we are willing to spend money on? And, and is that going to put us in a position where we are only able to do one thing mm. with this piece of equipment? And we've avoided that for the most part, which is, um, which Lee Graves, uh, the chief manufacturing officer, was that was a that was a big thing for him, and and I'm really grateful because it it kept us moving in a direction where yes, we're making plastic bottles, but we can make seven different sizes of plastic bottles, and we can ornament all of those different sizes in in multiple different ways, and we can utilize the same equipment. We have some inherent flexibility in that, so. If the projections change, for example, and they have originally, we were looking at large form 
products exclusively. We thought that was going to be primarily what we were going to be doing because mm-hmm. of the cost savings associated with um, not having to ship these huge bottles um, overseas. But turns out that at this point, at least, the demand is more for the small form bottles. Well, we have that flexibility built into the system. So we are able to shift and adjust for small form water bottles. And it does not cost, uh, it's, it, we're not doubling our costs by any means by adding you know these capabilities. It's yeah. just some shifts, um, which has been, I think, valuable to how we've approached this. Um, certainly, hindsight is twenty twenty, but the the yeah you wish you knew you wish, wish you knew all knew. of the yeah the, the demand the, yeah one of the benefits of of sort of the the slower ramp up that Wes was talking about that was very frustrating at the time is that when you're starting something from scratch, I mean we all know this you don't know what you don't know yeah. right there are processes that need to be in place in place and you don't even know what those processes are until mm-hmm. you start doing it and then you're like. We need until you feel the absence of those until processes. Until you feel the absence yeah. of those processes, absolutely. And so, uh, if we had scaled at what we thought we were going to scale on the mm-hmm. front end, there would have been no bandwidth to develop those processes. Mm-hmm. And it really, I would like to think that it would have turned out okay. But thankfully, we had some space, and it's only been a year. I mean, we're not talking years and years. We've been producing for a year now, so. Uh, just having a little bit of breathing room to figure out what those processes need to be and then having the full support of the executive team and of of the company as a whole to to dig our teeth into developing those processes it means we're only going to get better at this and that's been the thing that i've learned is how iterative Mm -hmm. this has been i mean we start going like wes was talking the bias towards action you just got to get started but it's iterative. You, you you start it and you think, okay, this was probably not the best way to do this, but you won't know that until you're doing it. Yeah. And then you can adjust and, and everybody being okay with that tension, everybody sort of being okay with this, with the iterative nature of it and what it takes to learn to do anything really well. Um, that's key. I mean, that's been the key to the success is that Wes and I and the whole team has had the freedom to go through that iterative process, which has enabled us to get better. We're yeah. producing better things. We can do it at scale significantly better than we could. Right. And we have the flexibility to do it. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's a, a fantastic point, Jenny. And one of the analogies that I give is, you know, there's only so much you can learn about swimming by reading about swimming and thinking about swimming exactly. and planning what it would look like for you to go and get in the you know, the lake and, and do the, the breaststroke across the lake. Like at some point, the only way you can learn more about swimming is by getting in the water and struggling to swim. And there's a lot of things in business that are the same way. I mean, I love even things like this. It's a great resource that hopefully will help people in, in whatever pursuit they're working on, help them to be successful. That's really the heart behind the podcast. But it's not a substitute for what you're talking about. It's not like you can listen to this and be like, all right, I'm ready to stand up manufacturing. You <laughs> know, I know what to do. That's exactly like there's some some principles. And and what I think I've learned is that the thought you put in on the front end and the, the learning that you do, where it helps is as you're going through the iterative process, you have kind of a framework and the learning within the iterative process goes faster. You still have to make the mistakes, but maybe you don't have to make quite as many Maybe the breakthroughs become obvious a little bit quicker than they would have otherwise uh, when when you have resources that you can incorporate. But uh, to some extent, like you just have to go through it in order mm. to get better. And, you know, if you take anything that any of us are good at in our lives, the reality was we were not very good at it when we first started. Right. And the only way we get there is by doing it poorly first and then and then getting better. So uh, let's walk through how we actually did this. We started with uh, about two years ago, Lee and I went to California and went to a show, started looking at equipment and made a, a key acquaintance, uh, Dave Bader, who uh, was somebody who was very knowledgeable and helped connect us to several people in the industry. And we started uh, planning out the different equipment that we might buy. And then we needed a facility. So tell us about the facility that we use. So it's a, a lease facility right now, but we're in a 180,000 square foot uh, facility. Uh, we've got about 30,000 foot of office space up front. Um, we've got 150,000, the remainder in the back. We, we utilize about 
probably two thirds of it for warehousing at the moment. Um, we're we're uh, working on our order fulfillment ca- uh, capabilities. Yeah. Um, we also have our uh, customs department in there where we do all of our customs engraving, um, personalization, uh, all of our custom processing, and then the the remainder of that is what we're using for our our. Uh, manufacturing. So you actually have a lot of different activities that are happening under the same roof and that yep. was intentional. That was intentional. Yes. We are, our customs department was at a third party uh, site at the time um, before we got this facility. Um, I think there's always a desire to bring those uh, in house with us. Uh, so just so we could just incorporate them a little better into you know our overall culture and our over, overall um, fit they were a, a little bit uh, siloed unintentional uh, just due to uh, their physical location but uh, getting them over there with with uh, our area uh, certainly helped make them feel you know more part of the company um, the the warehousing side of it is is something that we're we're certainly wanting to to work towards on on our own order fulfillment uh, capabilities um, and grow that as a as a business unit. Yeah, and it kind of is, speaks to the optionality you guys were talking about that there were a lot of different activities we felt like could help the business. Yeah. So one of the things I want to transition to is talking about culture. When we first started considering this, one of the things, frankly, that we were told by people is you don't want to get into manufacturing. People don't want to work, you know, like you're not going to be able to attract the the type of people that you want and you're not going to be able to hang on to them. And this is, you know, this is just a headache. You shouldn't do it. Uh, but the two of you, I think, have been really exceptional when it comes to culture building and being intentional in this area. So I, I'd like to ask you some questions around that. Um, I, I guess I would start here. What have been your priorities when you, as you have built the team uh, at our manufacturing facility and you've thought about building culture there? That's a that's a huge question. There's a lot of different things that that Wes and I and really the whole team spends a lot of time talking about. Um, obviously, it starts with hiring. You know, bringing in the mm-hmm. the, the right people. Um, and the beauty of kind of what we inherited. He mentioned the the custom team that we moved that over to that facility. We ha- already had a group of individuals that were very high character, uh, proven uh, uh, aptitude, as you mentioned. And we utilized those people to start with, even on the manufacturing side. So people were cross-trained from, they were in the morning unloading trucks. They were, you know, in the middle of the day, lasering bottles. And in the afternoon, they were helping on the manufacturing line. And uh, what that enabled us to do is we sort of were able to, especially at the beginning, seamlessly blend this culture with the people that were there, the culture that had already been developed. Mm -hmm. Um, Then we were able to utilize those people and their spheres to connect us with high caliber human beings who really want to work, who who are bought in to the mission of Simple Modern, which is the the key to the culture. Uh, It was already proven, you know, character that was already proven. And um, John likes to talk about the the different things that we hire for. Well, that same thing applies over in manufacturing. And we've been very fortunate. It, It is a different kind of person but it it it's the it's the the differences actually brings more value to the company as a whole because you have a different level of experience a different level of of uh, different backgrounds right we've, we've got people from all kinds of places it certainly made the company a more diverse company yeah and, and richer sure. and richer yeah. because of it um and i mean we can all learn from other people's experiences and there's a lot that goes into culture building aside from hiring, but that's sort of been our our pathway up to this point in hiring. And it goes back to one of the other benefits of having some time uh, from when we first started to now we're scaling is we ha- haven't had to battle that urgency bias that says we have to hire someone and we have to have a warm body and mm-hmm. we have to do it right now, is that we were able to utilize the people uh, better yeah because of that and um, we have used temps to kind of fill in but we have also required that everybody that works at simple modern is a carrier of the culture and and people rise to the occasion and so when uh, 
people are out there on the, the, the guys and gals that we have out there working on the floor, they know that they're responsible for carrying on the culture. And it's a weight that they carry. And it's a badge that they carry proudly. So even when new people come in, temp workers or uh, someone that's new to the new to the team, we've already established that. But it yeah. started with people that went before us, really, and created that culture. Mm -hmm. A couple of things that you said there that are just worth emphasizing. One is that historically, we, we don't really advertise job openings the way that typical companies do. We have really, really heavily leaned on referrals for the reason that you mentioned. What we have found is that it is so much easier to find people that are aligned with the kind of culture that you want to create mm -hmm. by asking people who have proven they're aligned with that culture who else they know that, that would be a good fit. And uh, so uh, sometimes we grow slower as a result um, but I think it's really worked well for us. And I, I think another good point that you made is most companies, it's just like, well, we have a position open, so we need to hire somebody right now. So who's the best candidate available? And I think that we have thought about our growth differently with the company where sometimes we've said, hey, you know what? We don't have the right candidates. We're going to slow down growth in this area for a little bit until the right candidate is there. And it's a good example of how culture can sometimes be kind of subservient to the bottom line, where it's like, well, you know, this is going to grow revenue by another 3%, and so we have to do it, and it doesn't matter if we can't get the right person or we don't know who the right person is right now. Got to grow revenue. Right. And we certainly have a growth orientation with the company, but not at all costs, right? That we want to grow, but the reasons why we want to grow don't come above the culture. And so I think it's a great point that... Um, as we've grown the team, growing it right um, mm -hmm. has been more important to us than than growing it fast. It was you've got a, a background in kind of maintenance and safety. And uh, one of the things about culture that I'm super interested in is how do you build teams with trust? Uh, obviously, like when you're in manufacturing, trust matters even more. Like somebody not doing their job could mean that you like could get very seriously hurt. Um and so how do you build a culture with trust, um, especially in a place that, where you really need it, like a manufacturing environment? So this one's very important to me. Um, the, the best way that I personally can grow trust within our team is to be out there with them. So, mm -hmm. you know, learning the line, knowing the process inside and out, and not just so you can show somebody to do it and walk off, but you do it with them. And, you know, I, I was just... Uh, Somebody made mention to me the other, uh, I guess yesterday, uh, there's some videos out there of me personally, you know, carrying bottles on the line, loading and unloading the line. I didn't even know they were out there, but that just goes to show that, you know, you have to be out there as a leader, you know, showing your teammates and the people they're trying to lead that you're fully vested in what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, my, my history, uh, ran, a, uh, with the mining, uh, the mine that I ran, you know, I had to guide a bunch of guys in a bunch of different pieces of equipment and, you know, there's efficiencies involved. There's of course the safety aspect and well, for me to properly guide them, I need to know how to run that piece of equipment. You know, I may not be the best at it or the, an expert at it, but I need to know how it functions and I need to know the ins and outs of it. Uh, it's the same thing here. You know, if, if you're out there with those guys, elbow to elbow and, you know, people elbow to elbow, um, you know, walking through that walk with them, then when you can hand that off and let them run with it, then you just, they have that trust in you that, that you're going to guide them where they need to go. Yeah. Wes Especially, does that really well. Wes does that really well. Uh, just, uh, but, well, both of you do it really well, honestly. I mean, I've seen, I've seen that from both of you. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that comes with taking on a zero to one endeavor is that you just, you're going to have to be on the front lines. You know, it's going to involve a lot of getting your hands dirty and being there. Um, and one of my favorite, you know, parts of the company's history, I'm obviously not able to be involved on a daily basis in the manufacturing, but was able to be really, um, present whenever we were first getting equipment delivered and starting to figure out how do we make these plastic bottles? How do we paint them? And to me, that was one of the things that stood out is just how deeply integrated both of you were uh, within the the culture and within the day-to-day -day processes and that you were leading by example. And obviously, like as a company grows, you know, roles change and, and you gradually abstract out of that. But I think both of you did a have done a really good job of showing the way. And also, to your point, Wes, if you're 
trying to scale that team, then it starts with somebody knowing how to do it well. And there, you know, there's very few people in the state of Oklahoma that know how to make a plastic bottle well. So first, you had to really learn, how do I make a plastic bottle really well? And then have people watch you do it, and then have people help you do it, and then them do it with your help, and then them do it with your oversight. And it's been really exciting that there are certain processes in that factory that we knew nothing about a year ago, and now we're on second or third generation, where you don't have to be present for that to happen. And to me, that's the definition of good leadership, regardless of what we're talking I mean, Today, we're talking about domestic manufacturing, but you can take that principle and apply it anywhere. Are you able to multiply yourself as a leader? And both of you have been able to really effectively do that and, and do it with people that didn't know anything about this before they, they started working at the company. So um, manufacturing can become a really siloed aspect of an organization, right? Uh, and where it doesn't talk much with the other departments and where sometimes its needs are not really considered by like, you know, the, the classic example is that the sales staff doesn't think at all about how hard it will be for manufacturing to make something. They just sell things and they're like, where is it at? So how do you avoid that? How do you have an organization where manufacturing is really a cohesive part of the whole and it really is a collaborative process with all the other parts of the company? So a, a large part of that goes back to your trust. So when, when you trust each other in your different business centers within the mill or the, the plant, you know, it, it, it really tends to lead to an environment that just doesn't have a siloed aspect to it. Um, you know, I, I'm some of my uh, leaning on my past again, um, I was with an organization that, you know, uh, one organization was, was siloed in a sense physically. She so had a bunch of small, um, um, areas that were remote to each other. Okay. So teams um, were in different geographic teams locations. Were in, yep, different geographical. And just literally didn't interact with yes, each other. Yes. Yes. Okay. It was, it was very limited, but, um, you know, when we did come together for, you know, company meetings, it was, it was good. You know, we, we had a good, good time at that point. And then I've been on the other end of the spectrum where, it was all in the same factory except extremely siloed and that that really came from a, a place of toxicity um and and really you know a, a failure to take ownership of certain things so i've been fortunate enough to to live in both of those worlds and then come to this where it's a culmination of all the good things uh that i can i can really lean on and and build within our culture in a sense where it goes with the trust, but then getting the right people, making sure we have open lines of communication, is, is, that's huge. You know, that, that, that really lends to the, the siloed aspect, but then also ownership. You know, when, when, you're, when you're playing the blame game, you know, one, just like you said, you know, the, the, the sales team doesn't get what the production team can do. Well, if you just stop and talk to each other for five minutes, then you can really eliminate that wall from ever being built. So that's been a, a, a very uh, focused thing for me because I've been in that environment and I most certainly, you know, I just won't allow it to, to develop where we're at. So, again, back to the, the communication is, is key to that and then having trust amongst your teams to know that, hey, we've got each other's back, be it at corporate office or, or at, uh, at the, the manufacturing facility. Yeah. Jenny, what do you think? There's a few, you know, in addition to the things that he's talking about, there's some some very practical things that we've done. Um, and this actually really comes from the top down. Before we ever opened the doors over there or moved anything in, there was discussions about how are we going to do this? How are we going to create a unified culture with everybody? Um, so the executive team has space, uh, office space over there that they utilize for meetings or, or there is a, a lot of things physical interaction, even though we're in two separate locations. The sales team, for example, uh, twice a month offices out of the manufacturing facility. And mm -hmm. that is really key because a lot of their their work is with the custom department, talking with Wes and I about the manufacturing piece. So there's a lot of conversations that happen kind of like around the water cooler, you know, water cooler type situations. Um, the other thing that's just been key is the leadership across all of Simple Modern, the, the leadership's desire to bring in hourly operators into the company-wide events that are happening. And that could be happy hour, that could be uh, lunches, growth, we have growth week, so growth week lunches, 
the affirmations that happen that where we take time to specifically affirm individuals in the company and how they've contributed and how they are a blessing to the people around them. The, the hourly workers get those same affirmations in the same room with the corporate mm-hmm. staff. So it, it creates that sort of, we are all one company. Uh, another example is the, the giving is a, is a significant part of Simple Modern. And we have a giving committee and we have giving champions, which are individuals that uh, work for Simple Modern, but are liaisons between Simple Modern as a, as a company and then these organizations. We have a couple of people at the farm excuse me, at our manufacturing facility. Yeah, we call it the farm. We call it the farm. Uh, We have a couple of people at our manufacturing. A couple of the hourly employees are giving champions. They're heavily involved in that. They're they're, uh, donating their time, and they're also allowed uh, time to, paid time to donate. So um, all of that goes together to put us really towards the same goal, and we spend a lot of time talking about the same things as the corporate office. Yeah. So that and the fact that I'm over here once or twice a week, Lee Graves is over there, you're over there, um, presence is really important, conversations about culture is very important, and then just time, mm-hmm. face-to-face, hanging out with each other is really important. Today's episode is brought to you by Encore Fulfillment. Years ago, when we were getting our first water bottles in, we needed to find a partner to help us to fulfill them to customers. We knew nothing about the fulfillment process. We were all new to running a D2C website where we handled the fulfillment. And we were looking for somebody to help us do it with professionalism and give customers a great experience. That's when we met Encore Fulfillment. Based out of Oklahoma City, Encore has been a key partner as we have grown the brand from selling just a few units a week to now hundreds of thousands of units weekly. They've handled fulfillment needs, not just for our website, but can also do mass PO fulfillment and other important logistical things that we need as we grow. I've really enjoyed working with the leadership of Encore and the way that they have built their business around us as a true partner. I know that they would be a great solution for your growing e-commerce business as well. That's why it's easy to advocate for Encore Fulfillment, today's sponsor. You referenced this, and so it's probably worth sharing. One of the things that I love is we have some local nonprofits that are in areas of focus that we work with, and we have multiple employees that have really thrived at our manufacturing facility that came from um, recovery programs at those nonprofits. Right. That so it's it's been you know when we talk about being able to make an impact with manufacturing things here, one of the things we're able to do obviously is create jobs and create an environment where hopefully people can really thrive. And so it has been cool to see that connective tissue between our giving and all the employment that we do. That, that there really have been some lives that have that have been pretty d- deeply transformed as a result of. Um, the nonprofits we support and the employment that we've been able to create. And some of, you know, there's some examples of them becoming leaders in the culture and leading other people, which has been really encouraging for me to watch. So you have partners come on both sides. You've got suppliers that you're buying from and they're quoting you timelines and prices that um, sometimes don't happen as we have learned. Um, And then you have like, you're kind of partners within the organization, the sales team, and they're using the expectations that you set to go and sell programs and tell people what we can and can't do. Um, And so sometimes there's a lot of tension there when you're told, hey, you're going to have this machine and you're going to be able to manufacture at this rate or this new paint color is going to come in uh, by this date. So you'll be able to manufacture and and that gets passed along to the sales team and then we're not able to do that. Um, Or the sales team is pushing you to do something that our suppliers can't, a a timeline that our suppliers can't meet. How do you deal with the tension of, um, you know, trying to work well with these parties on either end? It's not really a challenge working with anybody within Simple Modern because the Mm -hmm. people that are here, um, we're all working towards the same goal. And it is truly an organization that's just full of grace. So... I think we're in a unique position uh, to be able to say that, that there is not, um, there's not a lot of tension internally uh, towards these things. Dealing with outside suppliers, that can be trickier. Uh, Part of that is really 
getting to know the people that are on the other side of the email, mm -hmm. getting to know the people that are on the, on the other side of the telephone call, right? So that uh, they know you and you know them and they know that we are working not only for our own benefit, but also for their good as well, right? Mm -hmm. That it, it, is a, it is truly a partnership. And then the, in terms of dealing with the, the tension and when things don't go well, communication is the biggest thing, is, is taking your pride out of, the, out of the equation and presenting information as it is, and then everybody aligned to work towards the same goal without worrying about... Um, Optics. Without worrying about optics, yep. right? That that you have people that are trustworthy. Everybody is doing the best they can. And if if you go in and you have that assumption, that's the kind of the definition of the benefit of the doubt, right? You're you're assuming that the person that you're working with mm -hmm. is doing their job to the best of their ability. And there's all kinds of grace for when failures happen. And it doesn't have to be punitive, right? When something doesn't go right, we're not out to punish somebody right but we're out to find a mutually beneficial solution that uh, that is is good for all parties right and still accomplishes the goal and we found that pretty much all of the suppliers with with a couple of exceptions are are very interested in making things right when they know the people that they're dealing with when mm. they when they know that, that that it's truly a partnership and that it's not transactional um this idea that we work, you know, relationally instead of transactionally, that you have really taught the whole company, that's paramount to this. Um, and although not everybody that's playing the game wants to play that way, it goes a really long way when you deeply feel that way about the people that you're in partnership with. Yeah, it's interesting. One of my takeaways from doing the podcast, because uh, I don't know what everybody's going to say when they're asked the questions, uh, is how commonly the relationally versus transactionally has come up. And and to some extent, maybe that's an, you know, an indictment on our culture, the business culture that a lot of us have seen, that it is so common to just be transactional with people that, hey, when I'm in a business context, it doesn't matter if I, you know, that, that, that there's a person on the other side of this. It's just, it's just business. You know, it's not personal, it's just business. Mm -hmm. And we've really taken a very different point of view on that. And it it's come up again and again and again I think one of the things you said, Jenny, that's worth pointing out, trust, we've talked about the importance of trust. One of the ways that you get the the fruit, so to speak, of trust is that people are willing to be honest when things aren't going well. Right. And one of the telltale signs of a low trust environment is that when things start to go badly, people start to get in kind of CYA mode where it's not about kind of illustrating what's going on or where the problems are. It's about protecting themselves and obfuscating. And obviously that doesn't do anything, right. but make things worse. And so, you know, it, it's funny because trust is a positive connotation, but actually what comes with trust is that you see more of the junk, but as a result, you're able to deal with it, That's right. you know, and things don't fester into massive problems. Things get dealt with and they get resolved. One of the things uh, to go back to something you said earlier that I thought was really good. You're trying to create an environment of continuous improvement where every day we're getting a little bit better. How do you do that? How do you foster that growth? So what I've done, you know, again, giving the operators, you know, some, some agency to really look at the process, of course, knowing the process, uh, in, in depth and in, in at an intimate level, you don't really know how to make it better if you don't know what it is in the first place. Right. So making sure that, you know, I'm walking with them, they know that all the ins and outs of, of the equipment or the process that we're doing, but then also giving them the agency to, to kind of run with some ideas. Now, that also goes along with giving them the the open channels to communicate those ideas. But then also another important thing to do, and, and again, goes along with the trust, but, you know, not every idea is the, the best idea or the greatest mm -hmm. idea. So, but being able to foster, you know, a, a, a welcoming environment to those ideas, but also communicate to them maybe why we're not doing that or, okay, that's a great idea. Let's see if we can kind of, you know, take it this direction that's a way that we can really keep everybody in the organization over there you know looking for ways to improve looking for ways to to really in, in improve not only the the equipment the products the process it, it's a it's a great way to to keep them engaged and and just how to make it better okay so i want to ask a question about that 
you talked about giving people agency, which really means giving them the autonomy, the ability to make decisions, to try things different ways. How long is your leash on that? Like, obviously, sometimes that's going to lead to things going worse or, you know, machines breaking down or whatever. So how do you think about that spectrum of empowering people and giving them room to fail, but also trying to prevent them failing in fatal ways, you know? Right. So being present is, is a big part of that. So, you know, um, making sure you, you understand what they're trying to, to do, what they're trying to, you know, uh, test with. Um, another part of that, you know, and I've said these, these guys a lot, I've said it kind of all throughout my career. If you have a valid reason or you have a, a, a valid argument to why you want to try something that way or why you did try something, I'm all for it. You know, as long as we don't burn the building down mm -hmm. or, you know, we're in the middle of a production run that's this pretty, you know, high, uh, got a, got a short. That's worth short pausing on for a second, Wes. And I think it's, it's a point worth making, which is you want to create an environment, you know, where people have autonomy and, and can experiment. But there is also a time and a place when it's wiser to experiment. And there's times when it's like, hey, this is not, you know, we're about to do a run of 100,000 bottles. This is not a time to play with a new paint formula that we think might yeah, be better, right? right like, right. you know, hey, I, maybe it would save us money and it could be better, but we haven't proven it and we have to make this order. So, Let's get this order out, and then I'd yeah. love for you to experiment with the idea that you have. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Make, making sure that you know they they understand, and that's all through communication. You know, they, mm -hmm. they they can communicate to you what they would like to do. You can communicate back, hey, I want to do that. Let's hold off. Let's get through this. Let's get through that. Um, but that's uh, that's the biggest way that that we can we can attack that. Yeah, that makes sense. Jenny, you have any thoughts on that subject? Well, I was just I would say that Wes just does an exceptional job with the operators of making sure that that he is very approachable. Mm. You know, he's um, the biggest challenge has been we wear so many hats. Uh, it's sometimes it's difficult to be present all the time, uh, sure. both physically and mentally present. Whenever you have a lot of things pulling on you, and that's that's been a priority. Uh, for Wes and, and something that he's done exceptionally well is making sure that that everybody that's on the floor knows that he is available. It may mean that you have to, you know, kind of tongue on his shirt a few times, right? Because right. he's in the middle of doing something else. But um, I think that approachability is key to a lot of the things that Wes has been talking about, just in terms of trust and um, leadership, culture, as well as this continual continuous improvement is is that they know he's not going to jump down anybody's throat. Like that's not, and my understanding, I've never worked in a factory outside of what we're doing, but my understanding is that that is not the norm, right? Yeah. <laughs> that it is not the it's norm not, that know. operators feel like they, uh, that they're the, the leadership that management is eminently approachable and, mm -hmm. and, and that ideas are valued. And it's something that Wes has done exceptionally well. And it set the tone for the whole manufacturing organization. Yeah. So uh, how much production are we doing right now and how quickly have we scaled up to that level of production? So this is the first program or first uh, set of programs that we've done uh, concurrently. So our, our first uh, program we put through the, 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 the plant, let's see, we started installing equipment in, in August, August of last year and uh, we put our first bottle down about middle of September. So mm -hmm. it was a whirlwind to get it going. And we completed that program at 120 ish thousand units, um, by November. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Middle of November. Um, <clears throat> we, we hit a few small programs here and there, uh, through the spring, but we really ramped up to, to hit some of our, our programs that are either setting now or going to set in the, uh, fall for, for the, the new year coming up. But, Right now, we've just the other day we had I'll say eight open POs uh, with approximately two hundred fifty thousand units just across those eight POs, and there were several POs that we completed uh, up front of that. But to go along with that, you know, that was a mix of probably six to eight different SKUs that that we've worked through, and multiple POs were issued at different times that had the same SKU on them. So uh, really being able to dig in and have a, a pretty wide product mix uh, has really ramped up. So um, as mentioned before, you know, the the slower start was, was really a blessing, and, and it really helped us get a lot of these processes in place 
to to be prepared for the the ramp up and um we've got of course you know more room to go but uh we've 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 hit it we've hit it pretty good this this past uh a few couple months yeah and it's absolutely turning into a strategic advantage it wasn't a quick one it wasn't a cheap one mm-hmm. but uh we have the ability, uh, just a simple example, we have the ability to use Triton Renew, which is a recycled product that is really exciting. Um, you can only use that if they can verify that you're using it and you're a domestic manufacturer, for example. So we can you know, do something meaningful when it comes to reuse in the environment, um, when it comes to costs and you know, a carbon emissions from moving things around when it comes to speed and how much inventory we have to keep on hand. I think we've seen a lot of really positive benefits. And like you said, we were really right at one year in. So, you know, this is in some ways a podcast about us. Uh, It's like a time capsule on us (laughs) a year into the process. Mm -hmm. It'll be really interesting uh, five years from now or whatever to come back and listen to this and say, okay, how were that the seeds of what we ended up growing into? Uh, But another exciting thing for me has been that you've been able to use that facility to do a lot of other manufacturing type things like the custom laser engraving. Um, We got a we got a digital printer that does some really cool stuff. And I think we're going to be getting into powder coating very soon. And all it's doing is really increasing our ability to make exactly what customers want. And if there's one thing that we've seen with the Internet and our digital sales channels, especially, it's being able to be agile and being able uh, to do things that are custom and unique is really where the industry is going. That instead of the industry commoditizing towards, okay, everybody just gets a cheap black water bottle, it's gone the opposite way where fashion and uniqueness and personalization really matter. So I think it's been a, a huge advantage for us. So a couple more questions for you. Um what are some of your favorite memories over the past couple of years as we've stood this up? What are some memories that stand out? Probably my favorite memory, and it involved Wes wearing uh, United States uh, oh. themed pants, <laughs> yeah. was the um, all in day that we had at the manufacturing <laughs> facility. We were approaching the end of the big program that we started, the very first one, which were gallons, um, and it was about 120,000 units total. I think we had to have 80,000 units packaged to start with. And they had to be in these rainbow pallets in a very specific order in four different layers. And the packaging was very specific. Um, And it was a whole lot of pallets that we had to build. And as we talked about, we had a pretty small team. We run pretty lean. And these Mm -hmm. are people that were kind of, they call them the OGs, right? These were the people that were there from the beginning. We needed more hands. And so one of the options was let's bring in some temps and, and, uh, That was an option, but in your wisdom, you had the brilliant idea of let's utilize... We'll use wisdom in quotes, you know. (laughs) I think it turned out really great, but uh, to utilize the corporate office, the corporate staff as the extra hands to make this happen. And, And the reality is, is that all that entire process leading up to this... We had people from the corporate office doing shifts over Mm -hmm. at the manufacturing facility, flame treating, loading and unloading bottles, screen printing, packaging. You know, we had a a lot of people doing a lot of different things. So most everybody from the corporate office had had some hand in manufacturing the bottles, which was huge. It just, it created an entire buy-in, like sense of buy-in that I don't think would have been there otherwise. But this was an event. It was everybody at the manufacturing facility to do a marathon packaging. I don't remember. I think we did 500 pallets or something. I can't remember now how many we did. Um, and it took most of the day. We got done about three. Uh, it did involve, as I mentioned, Wes wearing some American flag pants and leading the whole company in some warm-up stretches. We we ended up having s- some time to do some relays at the end yeah. <laughs> where who could build the rainbow pallet the fastest, who could fold the specific tray the fastest. And um, overall, it was just a wonderful experience. And everybody got to get to know this was one of the first events where uh, everybody as a group got to know the people that had been working at the manufacturing facility and interact with them for an entire day more in a, in a group type setting it was just fun it was fun we got a lot done uh you know many hands make light work i don't think it was light work by any means but uh it was doable and it was paramount to us getting this product out the door and it has really sort of created this, uh, I think, company-wide. People look at this facility very affectionately. Like this is, mm-hmm. they, 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 part of their life and part of their memories are involved 
there, which is great for culture, for morale, for experience, for... And it was kind of, we've grown so much since then that the people that were there feel like, yeah, yeah, I was there for that. You know, Absolutely. I got to be there for that. So well, and it's like a badge of honor. You know, they, you, I've heard this advice before that part of building startups is doing things that don't scale. We did a lot of things that actually don't scale uh, during the initial process. But one of the reasons why we did that is that fundamentally my thought was if you're going to have a unified culture, part of how you get unity is people having empathy and understanding for what everybody else does and appreciation for it. And I've really found a tendency in myself, we'll say, that if I don't see it, I don't think about it. And if I don't think about it, then I don't have any empathy for the person that's doing it. I only think about it when it's not going right Right. and I'm frustrated, you know? And so I, I thought, hey, this is a great opportunity for everybody in the company to do the work and realize the work is hard you know, first of all, and that uh, to value the work that that's getting done every day and that it's not as simple as you might think when you're clicking away in Excel um, and you're like, this is so simple. This is the number. Why, why were this not the number of things on the palette? And to, to build that sense of camaraderie and empathy. And like you said, also to like, hey, we did this together. This is a flag in the moment ground and we did it together. And I definitely felt like that day was was one of those. Wes, you got a favorite memory? Um, I do. It <clears throat> took me a little longer to, to come up with mine, not because I don't have one. It's just it's, there are a lot of good ones that I try to pick one that stood out. But I've got I kind of landed on a couple. Uh, one of them, and I Jenny told me I should use this one because I, I say it a lot, and I was like, yeah, that's that's probably a good one to use. But it was my very first week uh, with the company. Um, we were actually in a giving summit the, the first week I started, and – uh, sitting through there, I believe it was a Wednesday and it, it had been brought up in the interview about the, uh, employee giving, uh, mm-hmm. benefit. And it was kind of mentioned, yeah, I'm not sure if, you know, you'll, you'll get to, to participate cause you know, you're, you'll, you'll be just starting or maybe not start by then. And so that's fine. You know, it's perfectly good, but, um, we talked a little bit about it. Well, <clears throat> We go through and it, towards the end of the, the giving summit, uh, we're talking about, you know, how that works. And and I was actually, you know, forwarded the, the survey and, and all the paperwork. And I was literally three days old to the company and got to participate and had just as much money to give to, you know, the, the charity of my choice. And that right there just right off the bat really showed me, you know, what kind of people, you know, are here and, and the, the, the level of trust, you know, that they have in me, uh, to, Mm -hmm. to hand over funds like that when you're literally three days old to the company. Mm -hmm. Um, the other one, uh, it it just kind of, it, it's kind of happened more than once, but it it was, it, it struck me a little more the other day, but, um, I was, headed home it was one of our typical 150 degree right oklahoma summers you know and uh, it was hot you know we we probably had a few hiccups here and there throughout the day but you know given given all the challenges we had you know the the past week the past day the 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 past hour whatever it was you know i'm 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 driving home just kind of radio off and just thinking you know it's like you know man i'm just happy hmm he was just happy to be here, man. You know, at uh, the the way that 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 everybody treats each other, the opportunity I have to to build something from scratch, not just you know from an equipment in a in a process standpoint, but you know a people standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, to take a, a, a dream, to take a a, a vision that the leadership has and, you know, make it a reality for them, you know, not that you guys certainly couldn't do it, you know, without me, but just to get to be a part of that and just, uh, you know, it's just, a, it's, I, it's almost inexplainable, you know, how, how it feels to, to be with an organization that, that is as intentional as we are. Well, appreciate you sharing that. I mean, the last year it has been, such a highlight being able to watch for me, I get, 
you know, I get the easiest seat in the house. Like I get to parachute in every, you know, every couple of weeks. And I, I don't, um, we make the joke that I'm kind of like, the, you know, I get to see the, the baby and miss the childbirth a lot of the time. <laughs> um, but it's been so fun to watch the two of you succeed and grow as leaders, you know, for me to be able, um, to be a part of empowering you with resources and authority and then to see the way that you've used it and and really to see the impact that you're having on the lives of the people that you lead. Uh, it's great. It's great the quality of product that we're coming that's coming out and all that stuff. But even more, I think the culture that you're building and the way that you're doing it is really encouraging. And, and really for me, it's, uh, you know, I know this isn't a particular memory, but I have moments kind of like your moment in the car, Wes, where... I'm a little bit overwhelmed by, hey, it's really happening. Like, this is what healthy culture really looks like. This is what it looks like when, you know, leaders are really multiplying and people's lives and their futures are really being enlarged as a result of being a part of something. And, you know, I just I just get overwhelmed, I think, with being grateful that I get to be a part of it. There, there are a couple of takeaways, I, I think, from all of the things you said, um, you know, the way that you have a long-term mindset and you think in terms of continuous improvement and that you're leading the way. But one of the things that stood out to me that I didn't say during the the interview, but as we're saying now is that what you've done is created an environment where there is no kind of caste system. There are not different levels of people. You know, we're one team. And that is so rarely true. Unfortunately, there are so many situations in our life where we're, you know, quote unquote, on the same team or the part of the same organization with other people, uh, but not really. You know, there's there's really just kind of like a, a hidden caste system where people are in different levels and they don't interact with each other and there's no relationship. And you've really gone about manufacturing in a way where you're treating everybody with value and people aren't viewed as, you know, having different levels of, of importance. And I think that that's part of the reason why you've been so successful. So thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks for everybody who joined us today for joining us for this episode of Scaling for Good. 